And if everybody's ready, we'll move on to the next item of business. There's a debate on motion 14400 in the name of Joan McAlpine on making Scotland a screen leader, a screen leader of the report examining the Scottish screen sector. And I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Joan McAlpine to speak and move the motion on behalf of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee. Convener, 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to be able to open this afternoon's debate on the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee's report, Making Scotland a Screen Leader. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the committee clerks and our SPICE researcher who worked so hard over the course of this extensive inquiry. I'd also like to thank the many individuals and organisations from across the film and television industry who gave oral and written evidence to the committee and who hosted our visits, including Ward Park Studios Cumbernauld, Film City Glasgow, Northern Ireland Screen, BBC Scotland and Below the Radar TV production in Belfast. We're also very grateful to the Edinburgh International Film Festival who hosted the launch of our report at the Traverse Theatre in June where it received an extremely positive reception from the industry professionals who packed the theatre. The overwhelming support that our report has received from stakeholders has made a deep impression and indeed is humbling, not least because these people are experts and high achievers in their field. The government, its agencies and important commissioners such as the BBC must recognise the significance of that overwhelming industry support for our recommendations, not just in this debate but in the months and years ahead. Since our report has been published, we have seen direct evidence of the economic impact of the screen sector, uh, particularly um, in the last week with the Premier of the Outlaw King. Um, this was a a Scottish production, Scottish producer Gillian Berry and, and director David McKenzie partnering with uh, a global giant Netflix. Uh, it's an £85 million production which more than justifies the investment made in it uh, by Creative Scotland's uh, production funds. And it's the need to attract more productions like that of international scale that was a key theme of our inquiry. It's certainly true that spending on film and television has increased exponentially in Scotland, an impressive 300% in the last decade. As well as Outlaw King, we can point to other recent and forthcoming successes, Infinity Wars and Mary Queen of Scotland, and perhaps most significant of all, the investment by Sony in Outlander. With all this going on, you might ask why the need for this inquiry, this report and this debate. Scotland's surely already a screen leader but we need to take a comparative approach. The worldwide demand uh, for high quality screen content is not to put too fine a point on it, insatiable. Netflix alone is making 40 productions in the UK this year out of 700 around the world, a global investment of eight billion pounds. We need to attract more of this type of investment, but time and again, our inquiry heard that Scotland was behind other parts of the UK in attracting it. So while we are growing, uh, we, we were concerned that we're not growing fast enough. And just this week, we heard James Cosmo, one of the stars of Outlaw King, bemoan the failure to capitalise on Braveheart, in which he also starred more than two decades ago. In particular, he uh, criticised the failure to deliver a dedicated film studio, a saga which sometimes seems as ancient as the battles of Bruce and Wallace themselves. Returning to our report, uh, it, it seeks to address some of the barriers uh, that we need to overcome, which were first identified in 2015 by this Parliament's Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. As well as the need for studio capacity, the committee then uh, uh, recommended that we need to address the failure to set up a proper screen agency. Uh, we need more investment. Uh, we, the, we need to address the failure of the BBC and other commissioners to support sufficiently the Indigenous independent production sector in Scotland. And we also needed to address the misunderstanding within Scot Scottish enterprise of how screen businesses operate. As a result of that 2015 report, the Screen Sector Leadership Group, a group of experts chaired by John McCormick, the former head of BBC Scotland and Scottish Screen, was tasked with making recommendations. They did so in January 2017 and they found that the public sector support for screen was fragmented with a number of different bodies having some responsibility in specific areas. This meant that there was no agreed overarching screen strategy and there was a lack of leadership and accountability and they also made recommendations about investment from government and wanting the BBC to spend more of the licence fee it raised in Scotland here in Scotland. 
My committee set itself the task of ensuring that the recommendations made by John McCormick's expert group were taken forward. And I think it's fair to say that the government preempted our uh, inquiry in the leadership group's report by announcing significant new money for investment in production. And they also committed to setting up a screen unit within Creative Scotland, something that was seen as a significant step forward. Initial proposals for the new screen unit were published in December last year and our committee began formal evidence in February this year. We heard from over 50 witnesses, from directors and producers to regional screen officers and educators. The new screen unit within Creative Scotland is intended to bring strategic focus and leadership by promoting Scotland as a place to make films, attracting international investment, supporting the indigenous industry, including through training, working with television commissioners to ensure more productions are made here, and crucially, to address the fragmentation amongst public agencies whose job it was to support the sector. It became clear early in our inquiry that the model set out in the proposals for the new screen unit did not command confidence among those working in the sector in Scotland, the people it was supposed to support. The governance arrangements of the proposed new unit introduced additional bureau bureaucratic complexity with five different public agencies sitting on its management committee. There was a distinct lack of industry expertise, at executive and board level, and the convoluted system of government governance involved multiple levels of accountability with no clear lines of decision making. The unit was also behind schedule. The long promised online portal for the industry, a place where anyone in the screen sector looking for support uh, could go, hadn't materialised at that point and key appointments hadn't been made. As we were wrestling with this evidence, the committee visited Northern Ireland screen in Belfast. It had been instrumental in supporting the delivery of a film studio and attracting Game of Thrones. It was completely industry focused and of course independent. The contrast with Scotland could not have been more stark if you pardon my Game of Thrones pun. Therefore, in May this year, we published an interim report which recommended that rather than pursuing an interagency model, Scotland should work towards an autonomous standalone agency led by the industry with clear lines of accountability. While I understand that our interim report named the bigger picture may have provoked some initial frustration in government, we believe that was both necessary and effective, as indeed are the recommendations of our final report. It is clear from subsequent decisions that the evidence that we have gathered has to some extent being influential, although a standalone screen agency has not, of course, been set up. Screen Scotland has now launched, albeit later than planned. Its governance arrangements seem to have been streamlined and recent appointments have bolstered industry experience at board level. Indeed, they include some individuals such as David Strachan, the founding manager of Tern Television, who gave evidence to our committee inquiry and who played a really important part in influencing our report. The committee welcomed the appointment of Isabel Davis, formerly of the British Film Institute, as executive director responsible for the screen unit. In September, Creative Scotland also published the Memorandum of Understanding to formalise the partnerships between the agencies responsible for the delivery of Screen Scotland, something that our committee also called for. We still await the detailed business plan which will underpin the operation of Screen Scotland. In a recent letter to the committee, Creative Scotland indicated that the business plan and recruitment of business development staff would be completed by March 2019. However, the committee remains concerned that the MOU setting out the responsibilities of the partners sets out a role for Scottish enterprise, which is broadly similar as before in that it provides business development support only for businesses identified as having high growth potential. Time and again, the committee heard persuasive evidence the Scottish enterprise support model is unsuited to most screen businesses. It bases investment on the number of full-time salaried employers, employees, but of course the industry model is based on freelance workers. Making a film or a TV production is by its nature a short-term undertaking. Companies expand and contract and this does not fit the Scottish enterprise model. We're pleased that business support professionals will work inside the screen unit, but we do not see that Creative Scotland should shoulder the entire financial burden of this, given that Scottish Enterprise is also funded by government to support and grow our creative industries. The <coughs> committee therefore recommended that part of the Scottish Enterprise budget be transferred to a standalone screen agency for business development. 
Another significant part of our report addressed the wrong running sore, as I've already mentioned, uh, of the need for a film studio and more adequate infrastructure in Scotland. Since our report was published, Netflix has spoken about what it calls the overcrowded UK studio market. There is a demand, so why can't Scotland rise to it? Other areas of the UK have done so, most recently Birmingham. At present, War Park Studios in Cumbernauld, where Outlander is filmed, is Scotland's only dedicated large-scale facility. And members saw firsthand how beneficial a production and facility of this scale can be. Much of the success of Ward Park can be attributed to the passion and drive of producer David Brown, who was able to bring a world-class production like Outlander to Scotland um, with minimal support from the agencies. The Scottish Government established a film studio delivery group back in 2013, which brought together multiple agencies with the purpose of delivering studio capacity. Uh, but it's not delivered. In a recent letter to the committee, Creative Scotland announced that a studio business case received the approval in principle from the Cabinet Secretary in July. And while the committee welcomes that announcement, uh, we, we await to be convinced given many decades of unfulfilled promises. Although enhanced in studio infrastructure plays a pivotal role in supporting growth, particularly when it comes to attracting large-scale productions, it's important we don't lose sight uh, of indigenous, the role indigenous productions play within the industry. Scottish producers told us public sector broadcasters don't commission enough content from Scottish company, companies and the committee says quite clearly in our report that it expects to see more work commissioned from Scotland by those public sector broadcasters. We want Ofcom to tighten up the definition of what constitutes a Scottish programme under the nation's uh, quota and we want more robust reporting in this area. We also recommended that ITV, like the BBC and Channel 4, I'm should afraid have a you'll nation's to, quota uh, uh, as part of its stop existing... Stop just a second, convene, if you sit down a moment. You've already had an extra minute. I can only give right, you another just, minute more. I'll just finish up Thank now. I'll just finish up now. Um, uh, the Creative Scotland's recent letter to the committee sets out a progress report in regard to uh, research work and uh, the gathering of data, which was one of our other recommendations. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, there are many reasons to be optimistic about the future of the Scottish screen sector, and we are convinced about its potential benefits. Uh, but we want to make sure that uh, we reach our, our potential. Uh, we want Scotland to be a screen leader, and I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Fiona Hislop, Cabinet Secretary for the Government. Eight minutes, please. Uh, Presiding Officer, I welcome this opportunity to focus on our screen sector and highlight the visible progress we've made in supporting our screen businesses. I thank the convener of the Culture Committee and all the committee members for playing their part in that. Uh, the decisive steps we have taken to strengthen and streamline support for the sector mean we are now seeing real momentum for success. What unites us in this chamber is a genuine goodwill and a shared ambition for our screen sector. And we agree Scotland has the talent and the skills, the settings and the stories. We agree that there are opportunities with avid global demand for content and escalating broadcasting spend in the nations, along with the prospect of a new BBC channel for Scotland and Glasgow's bid for Channel 4 uh, Creative Hub. Now, with the right support in place, Scotland's film and television businesses are showing just what we can do together, and I firmly believe that this is just the start. Let me begin with some highlights because it is important to record how far we have come. On Friday in Edinburgh, we celebrated the Scottish premiere of Outlaw King, a feature film shot in Scotland about Robert the Bruce. The film was conceived and driven by top Scottish creative talent, by its writer, director, David McKenzie, and producer, Gillian Berry. The film will soon be screened by Netflix in more than 190 countries around the world. What's also important to note that is that when Outlaw King was chosen to open the Toronto International Film Festival, it was only one of the four features backed by funding from Scotland. Wild Rose, a country music drama, Tell It to the Bees, set in rural Scotland, and the documentary Freedom Fields also premiered there, illustrating the wide range of work now being produced. As for television, we're seeing the gripping primetime BBC drama The Cry, produced by a Scottish company and filmed in Scotland and Australia. And it's great to see network drama from Scotland back on our screens and to see it getting such high audience ratings. And these are just a handful of productions breaking through. Overall production spend in Scotland has risen to record levels, hitting £95 million in 2017, up £26 million on the previous year. 
Filmmakers are seeing Scotland as a great place to film with Avengers of Infinity War, The Wife, and Mary Queen of Scots recently here. Plus, of course, Outlander in its fourth season, firing imaginations and drawing tourists to stunning locations across Scotland. The recent committee report is anchored in the thoughtful recommendations of the Screen Sector Leadership Group. We welcome that report and commend the sector for making the evidence sessions at committee stimulating, informative and valuable. We listened to the committee debate carefully and I am pleased to report on the progress made both prior to the committee publishing its report and since then. The steps that have been taken already largely address what the sector was asking for and says it needs. The sector asked for increased funding. We made an extra £10 million available for screen development, production and growth this year, doubling the budget for screen. That's in addition to the £12.8 million we already provide for BBC Alpha and one-off funding such as the £475,000 we spent to support the National Film and Television School to set up a base in Scotland. The sector asked for public sector support to be focused, visible and joined up with clear leadership. We back the creation of a dedicated screen unit, Screen Scotland. We believe there is now a coherent partnership between Creative Scotland and our enterprise and skills agencies. In August, this came together publicly when Screen Scotland launched its website, offering clear pathways to support in film and television. We were asked for expert leadership, and Isabel Davis, formerly of BFI, is now heading up Screen Scotland, with three new board members with extensive screen experience joining the Creative Scotland board. The advisory screen committee also has industry members and Screen Scotland is now planning to constitute the Screen Sector Leadership Group into an industry advisory group. And this will give the sector a voice in advising its executive on the direction and the delivery of Screen Scotland. We were also asked for a broader range of funding. Screen Scotland has launched expanded production growth funding of £2 million and a new broadcast content fund of £3 million. The creation of Screen Scotland may have been slower than I'd have liked, but I'm greatly encouraged with recent progress. MOUs have been agreed among partners. Partners are developing a new approach to general business development support along with Business Gateway. And two programmes of specialist business support are underway with screen companies and selected senior executives expanding their expertise, their networks and their knowledge. Screen Scotland partners have carried out an in-depth skills review of staff and freelancers to enable targeted investment in building talent and skilled crews and work on increasing studio facilities is well advanced. Creative Scotland is finalising a business case for a new permanent studio and it plans to launch a tender for studio operator shortly. With regards to studio, uh, Screen Scotland currently markets 136,000 square feet of full-time converted stage space, space and 335,000 square foot of build space. We understand the frustration that can result from delays to studio projects, but we continue to work with the private sector to find constructive and appropriate ways to help increase facilities. And having seen the effect funding can have, with the first £3.7 million allocated by the Production Growth Fund, resulting in an estimated £60 million spend in the Scottish economy, my expectations of the outcomes we can expect from increased support are high. I know that the committee... Yes? Joanne Lamont. I wonder whether the, the Cabinet Secretary could explain why she thinks the, the screen sector in Scotland is doing relatively badly in comparison with other places in the United Kingdom. You painted a very rosy picture, but I wonder if you've got any analysis of why we seem to be going backwards and not forwards. Cabinet Secretary. I don't think we're doing badly, and I don't think um, that we're behind in terms of uh, some of the spend, particularly around London and Pinewood and the traditional studios there, uh, I understand. But if you look at the amount of spend that we have compared to other countries, uh, currently uh, that spend is very comparative and very competitive. And in terms of production and production spend, we're actually also very advanced. I don't think we should be talking down our screen industry in Scotland. I think we should be talking our screen industry up. Now, I know that the committee had pr has proposed creating a standalone agency, uh, but I'm not persuaded that current circumstances uh, justify diver diverting funds that could go to screen to setting up a new body. As it is now established, Screen Scotland has the necessary capabilities and resource to achieve the outcomes that we and the committee both desire, and it should be given the opportunity to show what it can do. 
And there are big strides and opportunities in broadcasting too. I don't have time to set all of these out now, but extra funding has been pledged by the BBC with £20 million promised a year for network funding and £19 million for the new Scottish Channel. We welcome them and urge it to be uh, delivered quickly, along with commitments by other broadcasters, such as Channel 4, to increase spend in the nations. The Scottish Government has already helped improve delivery for Scottish audiences and industries with its work to strengthen the Royal Charter to ensure that the BBC must support the nation's creative industries. We can continue to work to support that, insisting to broadcasters and to regulator Ofcom that a tougher test must be set for what constitutes a Scottish production. Meanwhile, Screen Scotland will also work with new strategic partnerships with content producers to build a sustainable system to further enhance the quality of our productions and bring on talent. So we welcome the committee's work to seek greater transparency and rightly increased opportunity for the Scottish sector. All too often we have, as Joanne Lamont has done, focused on what is missing in Scotland. Today I have highlighted all that we have helped to create and all the support that we have put in place to go on making more of the opportunities ahead. The story of our screen sector is one of mounting success and I look forward to working with everybody in this chamber to generate even more concrete results and a long list of productions to be proud of that are made in Scotland. Thank you Cabinet Secretary and I call on Rachel Hamilton to open the Conservatives. Six minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee for the publication of Making Scotland a Screen Leader Report. And thank you to all those who submitted evidence and the valuable insight uh, that the committee got. Uh, I was lucky enough to visit BBC uh, Pacific Key, Film uh, City in Glasgow, Wall Park Studios and the Northern Ireland Screen in Belfast and gave us a uh, specific insight into those organisations. It's great that the ball is finally rolling, according to the Cabinet Secretary, um, with regards to a new screen unit. And we do welcome the increase in funding from the Scottish Government, um, but it's taken a long time to get here. And Scotland's film industry, we know, generates... £95 million pounds a year, and it, but it currently lags behind compatible nations when it comes to film studios. Wales has multiple studios, including the new 250,000 square foot Bad Wolf studio in Cardiff. Northern Ireland already has a fantastic 110,000 square foot studio. And Titanic Studios, which has attracted productions from HBO, Universal and Playtown, Playtone, it is now developing the 120,000 square foot harbour studios. And we heard recently that Game of Thrones, the successful TV fantasy drama which Joan McAlpine talked about, was eager to film in Scotland but was lured to Belfast by Titanic Studios. And that is now one of lar uh, the largest film studios in Europe. In my introductory remarks, I must stress, although this isn't part of the um, committee report, is that the vital role that the UK government play in attracting uh, the, the business environment for film production with a package of measures, namely the significant tax breaks which set the foundations for investment in this fantastic industry. Presiding officer, we have to consider the time it has taken to get to this stage. And whilst we all on these benches welcome the establishment of a new screen unit in Scotland, um, and I'm glad that the committee have also recognised the lengthy delays. The screen unit was, as we know, promised back in the 2016 budget. The SNP have failed to deliver uh, since that point. And the 2017 and 18 draft bu budget also promised a dedicated screen unit, which will be set up within Creative Scotland in the next year. Yet the 18-19 draft budget also promised the creation of a dedicated screen unit to support the screen sector. We've just seen nothing less than uh, broken promises. And the question remains, can a public sector collaborative approach deliver this studio? And will the Scottish Government accept the standalone approach suggested by the committee? But it doesn't sound like the uh, Cabinet Secretary is likely to take that on board. I will give way. Cabinet second. I think the, the member is confusing the establishment of Screen Scotland, which is the, the dedicated screen agency that is up and running and it's staffed at the highest level with the uh, opportunity for a film studio. And I have already, in my opening remarks, given you an update of the tender which is going out for a studio operator uh, for a film studio. So these are two distinct, related, but separate issues. 
Rachel Hamilton. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention. Um, if you look back to the film studio delivery group, which was set up by the Scottish Government in 2013, it demonstrates that that multi-agency approach has a weakness, and that is why the committee ultimately expressed uh, their wishes for a standalone unit. Um, but it's not just us, it's not just the other benches and us that have expressed frustration, it's industry figures and bodies as well. Um, they we're all disappointed at the timescale of setting up um, uh, the studio facilities and the Association of Film and Television Practitioners in Scotland said and I quote for decades Scottish filmmakers have had a nomadic existence using buildings that have been discarded by other industries ten years ago Scotland had the largest screen industry outside the home counties it is now far behind Northern Ireland Wales and the English regions Scotland's film potential is currently not being realised I'm sorry I'm not going to have enough time uh, and we must see action. Talent and investment has been driven elsewhere because of the lack of movement on this matter. And moreover, uh, James Cosmo, who was quoted earlier, who starred in Braveheart, lamented at the lack of progress. He said, I'm making his dark materials just now, a long running series for HBO and BBC worldwide. It's being filmed in Wales, where they have four studios. He even acknowledges that it does not look good for Scotland when that production could have taken place right here where it was shot. Whilst there are challenges presented by state-owned rules, I understand that, and I'm glad the committee considered it is unacceptable that whilst other areas of the UK have developed enhanced studio infrastructure in line with state aid rules, Scotland has continued to fall behind. I just want to make a couple of other points that uh, the uh, report highlighted. Um, the Scottish Locations Network uh, said that retaining and nurturing domestic talent is really important. The ve development of film, st a film studio would allow for a more sustainable pipeline of production in Scotland, meaning that crew can consider working in Scotland as a career instead of a short-term stopgap. They also pointed out that higher and further education isn't set up for production training. They gave us examples in, in, in Atlanta, they have created a film production training campus and there is a commitment by NFTS to open a focused training centre in Scotland specifically for those production skills. Outlander has been a huge success in uh, training uh, Scottish trainees and when we visited uh, the Ward Park studios in Cumbernaul where the blockbuster is uh, filmed we met some of those trainees including costume designers, set designers, plasterers and joiners and you name it. Furthermore, the ECOS skills survey is now complete and we do look forward to uh, a skills plan for the industry. Uh, Joe McAlpine um, touched a little bit on the um, public sector commissioning and this will also um, uh, help with regard to building skills and capacity in the sector and it's essential to attract uh, work from other sources. Just to conclude, presiding officer, we have a wonderful opportunity in front of us. I'm glad the announcement has been made uh, in the last few days to construct a new studio. It's very much welcomed from industry leaders and to these benches, but we look forward to further progress on this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Lewis MacDonald to open for Labour. Five minutes, Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much. Three years on and a committee of this parliament is once again calling for action to turn the potential for a world-leading Scottish screen industry into reality. I was a member of the Culture Committee when this inquiry began this time last year, and I was also a member of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, which reported on the economic potential of the Scottish film and television industry more than three years ago. A glance at their report shows that what that committee felt was important then is often uh, still what the current uh, committee report highlights today. And a look at today's report shows what has changed and what has not in that time. <clears throat> the first three recommendations in 2015 were focused on the need for a world-class film and TV studio in Scotland. The committee then called for government decision on existing proposals as soon as possible, for government evaluation of what more could be done as a matter of urgency, and for government direction of public agencies because their failure to work together was acting as a barrier to effective support for the economic and cultural needs of the film industry. Three years on, yes, there have been changes in these key areas, but there have not been changes enough. Scotland lacked a world-class film studio then, and we lack it still. We were told then government had to be cautious about its approach, that it was up to others to make things happen, that the private sector would come up with the solution. Well, it's not happened yet, and simply saying uh, that action will come is no substitute for action on the ground. The government said in 2015 
that Creator Scotland and the Enterprise Agencies and Skills Development Scotland really could work together to improve support for the screen industry, despite all the industry concerns to the contrary of which we have heard. Three years later, and there are still multiple agencies involved, despite the very welcome establishment of Screen Scotland and the cautious improvements in its focus, which Joan McAlpine mentioned. It is all the more important then that Screen Scotland is empowered to make the big decisions without constantly having to seek approval from other public agencies. The Minister is nodding and I hope she can give some assurances on that matter. Cabinet Secretary. Clearly any major investment, for example, over a half a million would need to go to uh, a board decision as per any other agency. It's now, it's now got three screen experts that are part of that. You've got the industry advisory group, anything less than 500,000 Screen Scotland can move on. And I'll, I'll give you that reassurance. Lewis assurance McDonald. is welcome, but of course, as the Minister, as, as Cabinet Secretary has just said, for the big decisions, they have to go to the Board of Creative Scotland. And that, I think, is the fundamental difference between what the government has taken forward and what the Culture Committee has recommended in this report and what the Economy Committee was calling for three years ago. And that is a, a, a standalone agency and an agency which is able to do uh, and make the big decisions itself. Of course, one of the recommendations from three years ago, which has been implemented, which has led us to today's debate, was the creation of the screen, uh, sector, screen sector leadership group in direct response to a recommendation in that economy committee report, and which will continue, as the cabinet secretary has said, as the industry advisory group uh, in the new arrangements. It was the report of the SSLG in January which informed the views of the Culture Committee leading to this debate and I hope the leaders of the sector will agree that the report which is being debated today matches the boldness of their vision. It does call for urgent and significant progress on a purpose-built studio in Scotland saying we need delivery not debate. It says that ministers should not hang, that means that ministers should not hang back because one particular project has fallen. They should redouble their efforts to make sure that projects come forward which can be delivered. And the committee has also warned that Screen Scotland must not be burdened by cumbersome and overly bureaucratic governance arrangements, as the convener emphasised today. But it was the production of an interim report in May, emphasising the case for a strong, autonomous Scottish Screen Agency, uh, which was unusual uh, and which I think marks the difference uh, in this debate today. And, and, and the committee report we're debating today builds on that interim recommendation and makes the case. It is the logical culmination of the process begun in 2015 to have that separate autonomous screen agency in the future. As we've heard, the Scottish screen industry was second only to London 20, even 10 years ago. It has now fallen behind other nations uh, and regions in the United Kingdom. So when we see the business plan for Screen Scotland coming forward, uh, I hope ministers will devise that in a way as a step towards the creation of an autonomous agency on the model of Northern Irish Screen, as the committee re recommends. I hope ministers will also take a proactive and imaginative approach to providing public support for the establishment of a world-class studio in Scotland, again, as the committee recommends. If they take bold steps in these two areas, the relevant committee in the next session of the Scottish Parliament will be able to publish a, a report which is about achievement and not only about potential. Thank you very much, Mr McDonald. I call on Andy Whiteman to open the Greens. Four minutes, please, Mr Whiteman. Yeah, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> and um, thank you and welcome. Um, uh, thank you to the committee for, for their welcome uh, report. Like any good uh, movie, to paraphrase the French-Swiss filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard, a story has to have a beginning, a middle and an end, but not necessarily in that order. And over the last few years, we have seen quite a range of plot twists, drama and suspense uh, in the story of the screen sector. When I look back at the history of film in Scotland and watching films like Whiskey Galore, Local Hero, You've Been Trumped, uh, more recently Trainspotting 2, indeed filmed in this building, um, it's clear we have huge potential for film and TV production. It's a growing creative industry that's attracting talent and investment, including the Outlander series and recent Avengers uh, movies. Yet for all the showcasing that's been done by a few high-value productions, we continue to have failed to capitalise fully on the many opportunities, and I think the committee report uh, makes that quite clear. We had Scottish uh, Screen, an independent screen agency that ran successfully of its own accord until Creative Scotland subsumed it uh, in 2010. Um, as long as a new body, Screen Scotland, is contained within Creative Scotland, it is hard to see how it will be able to properly 
uh, drive the screen sector as effectively as many other countries, indeed other parts uh, of the UK uh, do. So we need to think about how to facilitate and support this thriving sector. It's clear, uh, as uh, many, many people have made clear in the film sector, and indeed the committee report does as well, that we need at least one national film studio to provide the space necessary to support large-scale productions. It is also clear uh, to us that the Scottish Government must take the lead in making this happen. The First Minister, in response to a question I asked her uh, earlier this month, indicated that Creative Scotland will be launching a tender for investors to operate a public sector-backed film studio. This is welcome, a welcome development, but there are very few actual details, and I was disappointed to learn more from reading the Sunday papers this weekend about this than from the Cabinet Secretary uh, this afternoon. Now, this is about much more than attracting uh, investors. And the Scottish Government, I don't think, can no longer hide behind state aid rules to justify its lack of action. Back in March this year, when I substituted for my colleague Ross Greer on the Culture Committee, I noted that there was a lot of confusion about state, aid rule, state aid's role uh, in this matter. In part, it was evident that if the public sector is to lead the development of the industry in Scotland, then it must either operate as a municipal enterprise, like Manchester, under the market economy operator principle, just in fact as Lothian councils uh, operate a highly successful bus company in this city with no state aid issues, or it must be a wholly private uh, enterprise. So, presiding officer, that leads us to the final scene. Where should this film studio be? And of course, that's been a drama worthy of a BAFTA in itself. Jim O'Donnell from PSL Land Limited told the committee on the 29th of March that a site at Damhead in Midlothian was the best site for a film studio in Scotland. Uh, and the Scottish Government granted planning consent to that site. Earlier this month, as members will know, after a long legal battle, the smallholder who occupies most of the site Jim Telfer, a constituent of mine whose family have farmed the land for a century, successfully defeated an application to resume his two holdings. A welcome decision for a family that suffered considerable stress and anxiety over the past few years, but begs huge questions about the process by which we have been attempting to identify the site for a national film studio. To conclude, presiding officer, the Scottish Government must reach out and work with the industry to develop a national film studio that be benefits films in Scotland, but it should be minded that this can only happen in a location that is lawful and adaptable to the needs of a growing screen sector. Thank you. And I call on Tavi Scott to open for the Liberal Democrats. Four minutes, please, Mr Scott. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Like Andy Whiteman, I'll try and have a beginning, a middle and an end uh, as well. And the beginning is uh, a Swedish couple who I uh, met walking down the uh, road to the shop in Bresse, where I uh, live, uh, who said to me, uh, where did the murder take place? Uh, and I looked at the couple somewhat aghast and thought about phoning the local constabulary and then realised they were looking for one of the murder scenes in Shetland, which, has been, um, uh, which would give the impression that there's a murder there every five minutes. Um, uh, I, can, I can assure you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that is uh, not the case. But the Swedish couple are part of 28% of visitors to Shetland now who come to visit the islands because they have seen Shetland uh, on the TV. And the point there, in the wider sense, is, it, is that Netflix have syndicated that uh, particular production. Uh, it's shown here, of course, in the BBC. It's actually made by an ITN uh, TV produ uh, production company, uh, but, it's made, but it's now going around the world, hence uh, Swedes, Australians, New Zealanders, uh, indeed anyone you find in Shetland these days who's seen it uh, somewhere. Uh, and, and not only that, but... Um, uh, it is so good that it's been nominated for the Scripted TV Award at the forthcoming Scottish BAFTAs and Dougie Henshaw himself for TV actor and David Kane for film and TV uh, writer. Uh, we at home are a bit puzzled as to what they'll do next with the plot. Uh, they, uh, I, 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 I'm led to understand what's in next year's production, but where they will go from it uh, thereafter, uh, who knows? And so therefore, to the, to the, uh, to the middle of this debate, um, Andy Whiteman mentioned Whiskey Galore and and uh, Lewis McDonald and various other movies. Uh, I feel there's a sense of back to future, back to the future about this one uh, today for the very reasons that the convener gave in her opening, uh, in her opening uh, remarks. Um, why did we, uh, as a government and as a parliament, um, subsume the separate and independent Scottish film uh, company uh, organization into a body that's for all the arts? Uh, and the, and the uh, answer as to how that's not worked was the very uh, answer that uh, the Cabinet Secretary gave to Lewis MacDonald in the earlier exchange when she said that any big decision 
will be taken not by, this in, by an independent body, but by the board of Creative Scotland. Well, in fairness to Creative Scotland, they have many decisions to make over many areas of the arts with, with uh, conflicting and tough financial decisions uh, to make. And I think that is at the nub of why the government's approach on this is wrong. And I think the convener was very fairly pointed out the strength of the arguments around a single agency, a single organisation, a Scottish screen uh, simply taking forward what, yes, is, as the Cabinet Secretary rightly said, one of the most exciting uh, areas of activity in Scotland, both in economic terms and in cultural and artistic terms uh, as well. And I, for the love of me, am not quite sure that I have yet heard an argument for the government as to why that's not the right uh, thing to do, why that's not the right approach uh, for Scotland, when it demonstrably is across many other parts uh, of uh, the world. Uh, a number of members, Rachel Hamilton and others, have mentioned Northern Ireland. The committee uh, went there um, at some stage earlier in its proceedings. Uh, and uh, the evidence was pretty overpowering and overwhelming. Uh, so if the arguments can work for uh, other small countries, where often, um, we often have this uh, record played at us, then it certainly would appear to me to be appropriate for Scotland. The only other point I want to make is, I thought the convener's point uh, about the separate government agencies involved in this, in the labyrinth that was the original proposal, and I take the point that it has, had, has to some extent now been uh, streamlined. The most compelling evidence that uh, we heard, which in that sense that I don't think the Cabinet Secretary has fully addressed yet, and I hope she will in her remarks later on this afternoon, uh, was about uh, the, uh, the uh, range of organisations involved, the different agendas that some of our different, uh, different quangos bring uh, to that, and what more could be achieved if that was so much less fragmented, so much more streamlined, and so much more clear-sighted about what it's trying to do. And the only logical conclusion one can come to, and this is the end, is that should be a separate Scottish screen. Thank you very much. Uh, now the open debate speeches are four minutes. George Adam, to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr Adam, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I believe the committee's report shows the exciting opportunities available to Scotland in film and TV. And I think some of the debates, uh, the debate we're having here is, I almost feel like I'm in a television show, you know, some kind of alternate universe where I'm the only one that can see the positive side of uh, what's happening in the industry at the moment, because the timing of this debate presiding officer couldn't be any better because last week saw the premiere of the outlaw king and it's probably one of the biggest movies to be filmed in its entirety in scotland and in our screen history and the interesting thing about this and this movie in particular is how it's going to be distributed there'll be no going down to the local multiplex for this movie because it'll be distributed through a streaming service netflix are now in the business of producing big budget movies but I believe the Scottish Government have been aware and seen this when you look at the investment they have made in Scottish television and film industry. £95 million pounds invested in Scotland last year, up to the, from 2014 to £45 million, and in 2007 it was £23 million. But it is content that is king in this new multi-platform world of television and film. It's not in the not-too-distant future. BBC Scotland will embark on a new and exciting adventure as they launch their new channel. And once again, content and the use of the BBC iPlayer, or at the very least, easy access on the BBC iPlayer, will be key to this channel's potential success. It is, however, interesting when you look at people's viewing habits. In 2017, viewers in Scotland spent a daily average of 3 hours 46 minutes watching television in the traditional manner. This declines from the previous years in this multi-channel, multi-platform world. Traditional viewing declined even more so among younger viewers. In 2017, four to 15 year olds watched one hour, 27 minutes of broadcast television per day, down 41% from 2010. 16 to 34 year olds watched two hours, 16 minutes of broadcast TV, down 34% from 2010. But streaming content consumed by the same age group increases. Netflix, Amazon Prime, YouTube and subscription on demand service were all watched by these age groups regularly. So in order to have a successful TV shows, movies and documentaries, we have to follow the trends. And more importantly, presiding officer, we have to follow the audience. And that's why we come back to Netflix spending in excess of $100 million on a, histor a Scottish historical drama. Recently, we have, and other colleagues have mentioned this as well. Yes, no problem. Jo Joanne Lamont. I'm not sure if you're planning to get to this in your own contribution, but I would be interested to know whether you agree with the committee that there should be a standalone um, screen Scotland in order to facilitate the work it's done. 
George Adam. I believe what I'm trying to prove is some of the work that Screen Scotland has already embarked on and done recently with the fact that we've had movies like Avengers, Infinity War, Trains, T2, Trainspot and Outland are still ongoing productions here in Scotland shows that we are actually moving forward in a positive manner. So, presiding officer, all the Scottish Government's support of our film and TV industry, industry shows that this is the way forward. But as I've said, distribution of that content is the key to this ongoing success in this industry. Now, next year's BBC Scotland's channel is a testing point for me and one I hope that is successful. But as I've already said, content is king. And in this multi-platform, multi-channel uh, world that we live in now, access to that content will help aid any future success of that channel. And also, it will make sure that we have the productions and everything else within Scotland as well. So because we have live in a world, presiding officer, in closing, where families no longer sit around the TV, wa watching TV in their living rooms. They have other ways of accessing it. And we have to make sure that we are aware of this in everything we do in this industry. Thank you very much. I call Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Sandra White. Mr Lindhurst. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, let me begin by thanking the committee members, clerks and witnesses who have produced a very important piece of work on this subject. Um, I'm not going to be able to rival George Adam with his comments about YouTube, Netflix and all of these variety of uh, media, and, but I certainly enjoyed listening to his speech on that. And also uh, Andy Whiteman's comment that a film should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order, may explain some of the things that have happened in this parliament over the course of its history. Now, I was not a, a member of the previous economy committee, uh, which looked at screen and its economic impact, but what seems to be the two things, two issues that consistently arise in this matter, are first of all the potential economic value of the screen sector and the significant potential for growth for Scotland. And I say the, the economic value because uh, I readily accept that it is not just money that matters. And I'll come to the second matter in, a, in a, shortly. When it comes to Scotland aspiring to be a leader in the world and to be a welcoming place for business, including filmmakers, we would like to see that happen. The second aspect, though, is the frustration that the potential is not being met due to shortcomings that have been highlighted in 2015 or indeed long before then, and which have not yet been resolved. I think it was Ian Smith, who is chair of the British Film Commission, who said that, and I quote, on the larger issue of Scotland's image, how Scotland is seen in the world is directly linked to our participation in the media world, and that will affect how Scotland performs in all sorts of ways. So, presiding officer, the world knows that Scotland has the natural assets to be an attractive location for film producers, from the glorious beauty of the Scottish Highlands to the borders to the rolling hills of Ayrshire and many other places. And here in Edinburgh alone, we have our magnificent built heritage, including Coburn Street, the Royal Mile, St. Giles Cathedral and Waverley Station. And yet the dearth of strategy or infrastructure prevents Scotland often from capitalizing on these natural opportunities. Uh, just as an example, a recent blockbuster shooting of Avengers Infinity War, one of the most expensive films apparently ever made with a budget of between three and four hundred million dollars. Um, this included a seven week shoot uh, in Edinburgh estimated at the time to have brought 10 million pounds in economic benefit to this city. But without a permanent studio space with infrastructure to help continue making the film, the producers finished the scenes here, packed up, and went home to Atlanta, Georgia to finish the film. Rosie Ellison, head of film at Film Edinburgh, has reportedly said that Scotland loses films or only gains parts of them because of the lack of a large permanent film studio for indoor shoots. Now, while acknowledging that some progress has been made in recent times, the report uh, was highly critical of past lack of progress. Part of this may be due to organizational structures such as Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise not being suitable and being inflexible to the needs of the Scottish screen sector. Uh, an online portal for screen which is yet to be created despite the report anticipating this would be done before September 2018. And probably already mentioned most significantly of all a film studio delivery group established in 2013 
that has talked about providing the necessary infrastructure of a film studio, but which to date has not delivered. So, Presiding Officer, Scotland was one second only to London in the screen sector, and there's no reason Scotland should not once again become a home to many good and quality productions. Thank you. And I call Sandra White to be followed by Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'm not a member of the committee, but as uh, my constituency, particularly as citizen of Glasgow, is basically at the heart of a number of uh, TV productions and film productions. I really <clears throat> enjoyed speaking in this debate, and uh, I hope others will enjoy the contribution also. Uh, I would like to thank the committee and the clerks as well, uh, all those who provided the uh, evidence. It's been a very robust report on our film industry, and I think it is both timely and, and welcome as well. Uh, I do fully support the committee's ambition for Scotland to become a global screen leader and understand the recommendation for a standalone unit, uh, which was certainly the preferred option for the majority of the witnesses to the committee. Uh, the Scottish Government have outlined their reasons why this will not be the direction they will take at present, and I posit that word at present, and I know they've injected a substantial chunk of funding to the U unit along with their partners. I do welcome this, however, I do respect uh, the committee's uh, earlier rec recommendations. And uh, with respect to the current situation in Glasgow, our local economy has benefited from £15.1 million uh, boost in the last year alone due to the screen sector. And those at the Glasgow Film Office, I'm internally grateful to them, must take some of the credit for their contributions and efforts in securing large and small productions to the city. Uh, viewers across the, across the country were gripped by the most recent BBC drama, The Cry, part filmed in the city. Filming starts today, actually, on the spin-off to The Fast and Furious 6, uh, also filmed in Glasgow a couple of years ago, Hobbs and Shaw, The Wife again, filmed across the city, has just opened across cinemas with lead actor Glenn Close, a uh, tip for an Oscar for her performance. And as I said before, I really welcome the positive benefits for both Glasgow and the rest of Scotland through a vibrant, healthy screen sector. Now, this is where I come on to not being negative, and I hope people don't take it as being this, but as a uh, uh, Constituency MSP for the city of Glasgow, I represent a number of constituents who live in the heart of the city. Uh, we had a meeting last night. Uh, I just want to say when you are filming and when producers are filming, I really do think that any disruption caused by filming, which will ha and has happened, must be handled appropriately. Residents in the city centre of Glasgow, we only received notification from producers of Hobbs and Shaw uh, for the filming, uh, that's a letter there. We only received it yesterday and an urgent meeting was uh, last night to go over some of the issues, such as not being able to get into your own house, not being able to use your car, uh, gunshots uh, being heard and low flying helicopters. Still don't know what times they're happening. So all I say is, well, I'm don't want to be negative, I'm doing what my constituents have asked. I'm raising that issue that when something like that happens, please speak to the local people there as well, because it does affect them also. Now, Scotland, as has been mentioned before, has lost out in many large-scale productions, Game of Thrones, name but a few, Northern Ireland, and the evidence has been said before, Northern Ireland was chosen because it has the cap capabilities. They made the investment in the sector. So instead of being, as producer Ian Smith said in his contribution to the committee, content with the crumbs from the table, we should be aiming to provide all the means required for film production. The screen industry provides not just financial benefits, but a platform to show our fantastic talent. And um, I will mention Glasgow, our fantastic city and the, the great, uh, you know, architecture and heritage around there and it provides so many opportunities. I fully support a purpose-built uh, film studio and I look forward to seeing this being realised and in summing up, uh, I've only got a couple of minutes any, we have incredible potential but we need to provide the opportunity to realise that potential and not be happy with just the crumbs from the table but be happy with the whole cake. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms. White. I call Joanne Lamont to be followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I congratulate the committee on its report and indeed in its interim report, which I believed was proactive and was actively seeking to engage in what is a, a very important debate. And of course, 
That report or those reports follow on from the serious work of the Economy, Energy and Skills Committee, which reported in March 2015. And at that time, I was a, a privileged to be part of that committee. And it was then dominated by the issue of the film studio and the importance of infrastructure for the sector. And I welcome the recommendations that have been put forward in this committee's report. But I don't say this lightly, but I do feel that this saga is something of an embarrassment for us as a parliament. And I do think we need to rise to the challenge, and I think the committee itself has done so. But I do think the Scottish Government must do so now too. The work of both committees was defined by a seriousness of intent, thoughtfulness of those providing evidence, a rigour of the recommendations drawn up by committee members. But more than anything, it was work underpinned by the very substantial and carefully argued evidence by those who work in the sector, who are fleet of foot, who are passionate, but whose huge frustration at the lack of progress was evident then and remains evident now. Um, and I do think that we need to take their concerns seriously. The Cabinet Secretary said I was talking down the sector. If the sector itself is speaking out, we have a responsibility to listen to them. And when we celebrate the sector, we are celebrating what they're able to do despite the barriers that are put in their place rather than anything else. They deserve better than the current um, sense of apparent paralysis in tackling the problems faced by the sector, captured by the lack of a film studio. Now, in the inquiry that I was involved, there were a number of themes and they are as relevant today as they were then. The screen sector matters, not just because we celebrate creativity, but it also matters economically and should be taken seriously in terms of its economic impact. The role of the public sector, not as a facilitator, but as a break on the work of the sector, has to be uh, confronted. A sector that doesn't understand properly the challenge of those who are working in a global industry. And we're in a circumstance where people are saying they are blocked by what this public sector is doing rather than supported by it. And if I am disappointed by the lack of progress, how much more? How much more is the sector which took seriously both inquiries must feel? In 2015, Fiona Hislop, in response to questioning in the committee that I sat on, said that a studio being um, evident by 2016 was a perfectly reasonable request. We are now at the end of 2018, and I'm struck with the lack of progress, but also someone who's not been paying close attention in the very recent months looked at the reporting of this over the weekend and was struck by the recycling of explanations we heard two years ago before the lack of explanation. In particular, our old friend, state aid, that terrible problem, which seems to be unique to Scotland, that somehow we can't do anything because of the inhibitions of state aid, inhibitions that don't seem to affect studio development in other parts of the United Kingdom. And critically, we need to understand that recycling old explanations is ensuring that the sector is not developing but falling behind the rest of the United Kingdom. And that matters in terms of our creativity, but it also matters in terms of our economy. There is now a reasonable view that it is time that the, first, the Cabinet Secretary's recognition of a reasonable request needs to be answered. The committee report is thoughtful in its analysis and in its solutions. It is essential that those solutions are embraced rather than explained away. There are lots of things being done, but the fundamental issues that the sector asked to be sorted out two years ago and more and persistently and compellingly are still there. And I believe that That's sector, time, if it were being taken seriously in terms of its role in the economy, there would be far greater progress than there is now. Please support the recommendations of the committee and ensure that those who gave evidence to all of the inquiries this Parliament have had can see the progress that they demand. Thank you. I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Jimmy Halker johnson Thank you, President Officer. All of us with uh, an interest in Scottish history look forward to seeing Outlaw King, which has been mentioned already a few times today. Uh, and uh, it's already, as we've heard, getting impressive early reviews uh, for its portrayal of Scotland's wars of independence. Needless to say, having our stunning locations featured in screen productions like this uh, increases uh, our economic 
impact of these events and also uh, has an impact on tourism. And some of the locations featured in Outlander have seen visitor numbers increase significantly. Dune Castle, for instance, recorded an increase of 91% since being featured in the series, and Rosalind Chapel uh, featured a similar effect after the wilder claims made about it in the Da Vinci Code. Total production spend on film and TV in Scotland has increased by more than 200% since 2007. Outlaw King is the largest feature film to have been made in Scotland, with locations including Linlithgow Palace, Glasgow Cathedral, Glencoe and the Isle of Skye. Now, the committee has welcomed all of this and indeed the additional support from the Scottish Government. And another theme emerging from the committee report is the evidence provided that public sector broadcasters still don't commission enough contact, content from Scottish companies. So I think uh, there is an emerging consensus that we need tougher off-com definitions of what qualifies as a Scottish programme and better monitoring to ensure compliance. And a significantly greater proportion of the BBC licence fee raised in Scotland being spent here. But on that theme, presenting officer, I more positively welcome the BBC's new Scotland TV channel. We must keep seeking assurances about its funding and its structure, particularly regarding the channel's commitment to drama. But it is undeniably a very positive step. And the, to the production growth fund, also uh, funded by the Scottish Government and the National Lottery, with an allocation of 3.25 million for the period to March 2018, uh, also has made a contribution to, to the, the wider industry. The PGF provides a financial incentive uh, to major international productions basing themselves in Scotland, as well as increasing funding available for Scottish-based producers to anchor more of their production work here. The fund is helping to create significant employment opportunities for Scottish-based crew uh, and uh, delivers a direct and significant economic benefit to the country. Now, it would be remiss of me briefly not to mention the spectacular claim which my own, location, my own uh, constituency has as a film location. Some of the Hebrides landscapes would not look out of place in Game of Thrones. And we do have, as is often overlooked, I feel, many of the state-of-the-art studio and sound stage facilities to go with them. And the development of BBC Alapa has also proved something interesting, which is that independent production companies can flourish in our island communities. Though perhaps a location made more use of by television than by the big screen, the Hebrides probably did first come to the attention of feature film producers in 1949 with the much-loved Whiskey Galore filmed in Barra and Eriski, and which introduced uh, the culture and landscape of the islands to a wider world. Now, it would be remiss of me not to, to mention at this point, uh, in concluding fairly soon, presiding officer, uh, that though Brexit presently looms on the horizon as a figurative hazard to shipping, it is, however, hardly likely to excite the salvers in quite the way that the wreck of SS politician was able to do in the film. Fear over loss of funding from EU sources, hindrances to free movement of artists, performers and companies, rising costs and a damaging inward focus are the key concerns of the screen sector. But putting all of those questions to that side for the moment, presiding officer, the report we're debating today demonstrates the huge contribution that the screen industry makes to Scotland's cultural and economic life, and I am sure it will do even more so in the future. Thank you very much. I call Jamie Halker Johnson to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. For decades, Scotland has provided a spectacular backdrop for the screen sector, which, with a reach that spans the globe, and we punched above our weight internationally, all while f uh, films and television have grown to form a major part of our domestic culture. The screen sector has also supported other parts of our wider cultural offering. Scottish literature has often reached further and to wider audiences through film. Our history has been translated across borders and the benefits to our heritage sector are clear. Across the UK, we've seen a resurgence in our film and television industries. Earlier this month, the British Film Institute's report showed the importance of tax reliefs introduced in 2013, empowering the growth of the UK film sector. It's created thousands of jobs and contributed to our economic growth. And here in Scotland, we can consider the successes. Only last night, World War Z was on television with Glasgow playing a part as an American city. And there are a number of productions now set and filmed in my region, the Highlands and Islands, including, of course, as Tavish Scott mentioned, the extremely popular Shetland series on the BBC. 
and uh, Tavish Scott asked what, what will happen next. In Shetland, I imagine probably a spin-off with Orkney would be uh, a good one. Um, but opportunities are still being missed. Productions which are set in Scotland or written here in Scotland, but which are being filmed elsewhere. We have one of the biggest and best screen sets anywhere in the world, our country. But we also have for, for far too long spoken about studio capacity in Scotland. We know it's a problem, and now it's time for action. The rep report describes it as urgent, and if we're to invest in the infrastructure for our screen sector, that is not an understatement. Another area that the report touched on is the development of the skills relevant to this sector of our creative industry. It is disappointing, however, that the re recent statistics from the Scottish Government showed only nine starts in creative and cultural apprenticeships in the first quarter of this year. That's compared with 62 in the same quarter last year. The apprenticeship route into the cultural sector must not be underestimated or overlooked. If we want to see growth that brings benefits to Scotland, we must build the skills required and have a workforce ready to meet the demand. This is a sector that should be dynamic and inspiring, one where young people want to get involved with. Yet we are struggling to bring in new entrants via this route. So why is this? Well, the committee heard that the sector is diff difficult to access, that there is little awareness amongst young people of the career routes available into it, and that there are a number of other hurdles, such as a lack of distinctive Scottish qualification structures available. As the committee recommends, there needs to be a clear skills plan for the future, one built by the industry, but with the support of government. And that will be a vital step, and one that should be first championed, second implemented, and third supported. Scotland has an uncommonly strong cultural base on which to build uh, its green sector. We have a resource that is, if not untapped, certainly underutilised. We have a number of annual film festivals here in Scotland. We have one of the world's largest cultural festivals on our doorstep. We have access to world-leading cultural organisations and the ability to communicate our ambition to the world. Presiding officer, I cannot do justice uh, to the report in my allotted time, and I appreciate there are a number of areas that I've not spoken about. The interaction of public bodies is certainly important, as well as considering how they work collaboratively alongside the priorities of the industry. The report also acknowledged our domestic audience and the importance of streaming services and superfast broadband access, particularly in regions like mine. There is also a balance to be found between promoting inward investment and building up a truly domestic presence for the screen sector and ensuring that the support is in place for aspiring enterprises to grow and expand. But I will conclude simply by welcoming the contribution and the work of the committee and by commending its recommendations. Thank you. Can I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Gillian Martin? Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, I'm delighted to be speaking in this uh, committee debate uh, as uh, one of the members of the committee. It certainly was both a pleasure but also uh, informative to actually take part uh, in this inquiry. I'm pleased with the report uh, and the work that actually went into it, and I believe that this report uh, can actually help shape uh, the, a growing sector in the years to come. I'm saying also at the outset of the inquiry, we, we heard from uh, Tommy Gormley uh, on the 8th of February. Now, Mr Gormley is from the, the West of Scotland and he's also a first assistant director. He provided hugely beneficial evidence and for me it was actually some of the most powerful evidence I've heard in my time in, in Parliament. And now, I may not necessarily have agreed with uh, everything that he said uh, on the record, but uh, he stated this. Uh, furthermore, uh, on the larger issue of uh, Scotland's image, how Scotland is seen in the world is directly linked to our participation in the media world, and that will affect how Scotland performs in all sorts of ways. Now, he also, after I asked him a question about training and also future opportunities, uh, and he answered it by the, the saying this, uh, that there was no structure for training when I started. Uh, I'm thankful that there is a structure now. It is vital. Uh, things are much better than they used to be, uh, with uh, genuine skills training programmes in place with various agencies. Now, uh, certainly, signing officer, and this sounds a bit like, uh, like common sense. It also sounds as if uh, progress actually has been made. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, thankfully, actual progress has been made in the sector over the years. It has been slow progress, though, uh, certainly in the past. Uh, and our graphic on page 10 uh, of the committee report provides that justification and the frustration that many people in the sector and industry have actually felt uh, about this. And it also kind of highlights, uh, certainly I mean, Rachel Hamilton's comments earlier on, uh, trying to uh, kind of blame the Scottish Government for everything. But actually, much of this predates uh, the SNP Government, but also the establishment of this Parliament. Now, clearly, there has been a wide variety of activity since 2010. Uh, there remains uh, the, the outstanding issue of the film studio 
which uh, certainly others have touched upon already uh, today. Now, I've raised this issue uh, in Parliament before, but uh, and I also have a genuine belief that, uh, that my own constituency would be a perfect uh, location for any type of studio. And now, if the Lothians actually don't, don't want it, uh, Mr Whiteman, then certainly Inverclyde does. Now, whether it's the former IBM site at Spangle Valley or the former power station site at Inverkip, both uh, would lead uh, themselves to the creation of a, a lawful and adaptable uh, film studio of scale that uh, could deliver uh, the, the gap in the key infrastructure that is so necessary uh, to, be to be delivered. Now, the location is perfect with Glasgow International Airport merely 35 minutes away. Transport links to Glasgow are excellent. Uh, and we also uh, are the gateway to Argyle and also Burns Country just south of us. But crucially, though, Inverclyde actually has a history of programmes and filming. And certainly recently we had the ad adaptation of Agatha Christie's Ordeal by Innocence. Uh, that was filmed at the Argyll Estate in Inverkip. And uh, certainly uh, we've also, parts of Inverclyde regularly uh, are portrayed as being part of Shetland, which uh, Mr uh, Scott and I have discussed in the past. But Mr Gormley also told me something that day. Uh, and, and he put it this in a very kind of frank uh, manner. He said, they think of the film industry just as a shipbuilding industry. Instead of launching a ship, you launch a film. As well as the actors and camera crew, you need the joiners, the painters, the electricians, the accountants, and many, many other skills. So anyway, also, I know that Inverclyde can launch both ships, uh, but also films. And I believe that the, with the, this growing film sector and the opportunities in the country, Inverclyde can actually offer a part of that infrastructure gap by being the location for a much needed studio. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I call Gillian Martin before we move to closing speeches, starting with Ian Gray. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Today, in addition to my role as an MSP, the hat I'm wearing is of a further in higher education, former further in higher education lecturer of 13 years in the creative industries. As my colleagues know, I taught television and film production as well as running my own production company. And previous to that, albeit a long time ago, I was a film and television studies undergraduate. As a result of that background, I have a few niggles about our screen sector uh, reaching its potential. And chief amongst them is the lack of opportunities for students and graduates in Scotland uh, in the cre creative industries uh, disciplines to access financially supported uh, experienced opportunities in their own country. And I appreciate that the committee's report had a much broader focus on this, but given it's the year of young people, I thought I would hone in on this aspect of uh, the, the benefit to Scotland in terms of the young people. It's long been my plea that we should always consider opportunities for young talent, particularly whenever support decisions are made and funding is given. Of course, we'd like all production companies to start valuing young people regardless of whether they access public funding or not. I call on the screen industry as a whole to rid their sector of opportunities that only wealthy individuals can access. But given the levers available to this place, I would like to see a commitment made to give financially supported work experience and internships to college or university film and television students whenever support is given from the government funded agencies. And you'll note that I'll say financially supported. The creative industries are quite frankly, one of the worst sectors in terms of expecting young people to give their labor and time for free, and often at their own expense. Um, and I would say that at the very least, travel and subsistence overheads should always be met by the company. So yes, working for a production company will look good in your CV. And yes, it may lead to other opportunities. But I am tired of both those phrases being used as a justification for not offering financial support of any kind to young people. Those well-worn phrases, which anyone working in the creative industries will have heard many times, automatically excludes students from lower income families from accessing the types of opportunities that could take them out of poverty. I do note that some intern opportunities are given in lieu of credits for coursework and that many further education institutions assist with overheads incurred by students. But still, there are many production companies who routinely contact colleges offering work experience that is often just free labour, with little in the way of training, mentorship, and certainly without financial assistance. And if any of my former colleagues are listening to me, they'll be rolling their eyes because I was banging on about that for 13 years. In the same way Creative Scotland are required to commit to a percentage of Scottish spend, I would like to see a commitment to ending unpaid internships in the sector, and more importantly, a commitment made to include at least one paid internship with production companies accessing funding, preferably from the local area in which the filming is taking place to allow a geographical spread opportunity across Scotland. 
And the benefits of doing this are multiple to this country. Most importantly, we give access of opportunity to all our talented young people, regardless of income, geographical location and social background. But we also underpin youth opportunity as a condition of all our endeavours in promoting and cultivating a Scottish screen sector. Imagine the impact for a Scottish student if visiting foreign productions were obliged to take on a local student during production as part of any deal. The local knowledge of the student could enhance the visiting production team's visit and the connections made could be life-changing for the young person. Most importantly, this is an investment in our homegrown industry and our talent base. I hugely welcome the recent announcement of a tighter collaboration between the Enterprise Agencies and Creative Scotland and a National Film School location announcement. And of course, the amount of funding we put into our homegrown industry. But my hope is that young people across Scotland from all backgrounds will benefit from this funding, not just in the year of young people, but for years to come. Let's be a leader in that respect. Thank you very much. I move into closing speeches. Ian Gray to close with the Labour Party. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, there's been a significant uh, theme of consensus, I think, across uh, today's debate around the opportunity that the screen sector and creative industries uh, offers uh, Scotland. And I think <clears throat> everyone has made very clear that we have always believed that Scotland has the talent uh, and the locations uh, to take those opportunities. <clears throat> A number of speakers uh, have explained, I think, quite well why uh, those opportunities are particularly important just at, at the moment. Uh, George Adam, with his uh, refrain, Content is King, where he uh, took us on a, a run round the new platforms in which uh, he and uh, others consume uh, that content. And the committee as well, of course, um, uh, quote uh, Ian Smith from the uh, British uh, Film Council, who says, uh, ne Netflix is just the beginning. Beyond it, there are big companies coming in fast, Amazon, Apple, Google, Hulu, and beyond all of those, uh, is Disney. So uh, we are agreed, I think, that there is a, a real opportunity uh, and the Cabinet Secretary talked about the shared ambition for our screen sector uh, and I think that has been the major theme uh, of today's debate. But I think there is also, uh, perhaps not across the whole chamber, uh, but across most of the chamber, uh, a consensus that we have failed, that we have failed to grasp the opportunities uh, in recent years that this sector ha have allowed. Mr. MacDonald uh, was clear that we and he have been here many times before, but we have not progressed. We have uh, seen the opportunity, talked about what we have to do to seize it, but failed to seize that. We have missed many boats. Uh, we've heard mention of uh, Braveheart, made of course in Ireland rather than Scotland, Outlander, filmed here but completed elsewhere, Infinity War, uh, exactly the same. Indeed, Tommy Gormley, the director, told the committee, we have not just missed the boat in this country, we have missed an entire fleet. There has been a cataclysmic failure at every level to deliver. He calls it uh, a, a disgrace. Uh, others have moved forward, and this has been mentioned in the debate, Northern Ireland, with several studios, Wales more than one, Bristol, Birmingham uh, coming forward now uh, as uh, well. Uh, Joanne Lamont called this uh, an embarrassment. Uh, Ian Smith told the committee uh, that uh, if I look at a map of the United Kingdom, to my huge frustration, I have to say Scotland's, uh, I, I have to say Scotland is underperforming compared with other nations such as Northern Northern Ireland and Wales. Scotland used to be the second production cluster in the UK. Now it's fourth or fifth after Wales, Cardiff uh, and Bristol. And if we ask ourselves why this has happened, perhaps the fact that the Cabinet Secretary simply refused to accept that we have fallen behind other parts of the United Kingdom is part of the problem. Complacency and a lack of leadership in recent years, which brings us, of course, uh, to one of the other themes uh, of today's debate, and that is the need for an independent agency fully empowered to seize those opportunities. The committee were certainly convinced of that, and I don't think the Cabinet Secretary today explained why the government uh, believed that that view is, uh, is wrong. 
The other symbol of failure, of course, which many speakers have referred to, uh, is the lack of a studio facility. Andy Whiteman talked about uh, the Pentland proposal and the problems into which uh, that has now run. I thought Stuart McMillan made an important point. The studio doesn't have to be in Pentland. There are lots of places in Scotland uh, who could provide the kind of facilities we're looking for. He made the case as he would for Inverclyde. I have to tell you that immediately on the news of the court decision around Pentland, uh, some of my constituents in East Lothian have formed a campaign to bring the film studio to Kakenzie. And the local council are looking at other uh, sites within East Lothian or across East and Mid Lothian which would be uh, suitable. It is very difficult to see why we have failed to move forward on this. And I have to be honest and say the rather cryptic promise from the Cabinet Secretary today it doesn't really give us much hope of moving forward. But the final thing which I want to refer to very briefly uh, was um, the theme really of Gillian Martin's speech, and that is the importance uh, of providing opportunity for talent and ensuring that that opportunity is open not only to those who already know people or have family who are already in the business or have the capacity to work for free as an intern. We do need to create a skill strategy which is for the many rather than simply for the few. So this report is an important one. What we need, to see, though, point, what we need to see though is delivery this time rather than simply acknowledgement of the opportunity. Thank you. And I call Jamie Green to wind up for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Mr. I'm always tempted to say we need a screen sector that works for, for everyone, but I won't uh, resist. Um, I, I was asked uh, for 15 years, what do you do for a living? And I used to say, I work in TV. And the first thing people say to you is, oh, do you work for the BBC? Um, and I would face that question about eight times a week. Um, my career uh, in the screen sector is an interesting one. I started off as a runner. Uh, as Gillian Martin alluded to, unpaid for the majority of the first couple of years, trying to make your way in an expensive city as uh, uh, making tea for, for uh, annoyed uh, producers and angry directors. Um, but I worked my way through the production sector, and before I joined the parliament here, just two, two and a bit years ago, I was head of sales for a technology company delivering on-demand content technology to uh, telcos and triple and quad play operators. And I'm glad Stuart Stevenson isn't here today to tell us all about that. Um, so my journey has been an interesting one. My interest in this, uh, whilst I'm new to the committee, is very personal, and very vested, and absolutely unambiguous. But my career uh, in television was only possible by heading to the bright lights of the city, such as London, Manchester, and Birmingham. Unfortunately, uh, when I was 21, there were no opportunities in Scotland, and the opportunities that were here were quite limited in terms of the scale and range of domestic production that existed. I had really no choice, like many others, we saw opportunity where it existed. So the question is, 15 years on, uh, has the situation got any better? Um, technology has indeed changed so much beyond recognition in that short period of time. The screen sector is now so diverse from those days. It's so digital uh, compared to how it was. And whilst I've only been on the committee a few months, I found it uh, eye-watering. Uh, whilst producing this report. The screen sector in Scotland faces significant challenges, I think, as the convener outlined in her opening statement. There is potential. You know, it's not doom and gloom. Uh, there's great work going on. Uh, anyone who's commuting through Glasgow today will know that much of the city centre is closed uh, for the Fast and Furious franchise, which is shooting in the city centre. Uh, we know about the successes of Outlander. We know about the new channel the BBC is launching. We know about Channel 4's bid uh, our, our potential for a new headquarters here. Uh, goodness, we may even have a Scottish James Bond at some point, uh, who knows. Um, so there is a lot to be positive about, but this report is, is unequivocally um, uh, contained uh, with problems in the sector that have been addressed and alluded to so many times in previous parliaments. And it saddens me in a way that in this very short debate we're having, that we're going over so much old ground. The studio space issue is the eternal thorn in our side and uh, my colleague Rachel Hamilton and I were sitting throughout this debate hoping that the cabinet secretary is going to stand up and make a grand announcement about studio space in our closing statement and if it doesn't occur today it needs to happen soon we can't read about vague comments in the news that there might be an announcement by the new agency at some point before Christmas uh, this was talked about years ago 
uh, way before my time in this parliament. In 2015, there was a proposition and a tender went out for a, a public-private proposition. Uh, if there is space and it can be uh, found and there is buy-in, and I mean genuine buy-in, financial buy-in from the private sector, then I really do hope we see some results quickly. I'm glad that Stuart McMillan mentioned uh, some of the evidence that we took from Tom, uh, Tommy Gormley. As, as the witness said, there was a cataclysmic failure at every level to deliver. And he's not the only one. Uh, we've heard uh, other evidence. A producer, Ian Smith, uh, who, who's another Hollywood producer, said, I've been on two of these parliament committees with MSPs, and they all seem positive at the time, but nothing transpires, and I don't quite know why. Now, I, I, I was in uh, the screen sector for a decade longer than I've been in politics, so I really do share their frustration as to why yet another damning report has come out of yet another uh, Holyrood Committee. It would be a complete failure of government and this parliament if we're sitting here in another couple of years' time lamenting the same lack of progress. That is not talking the screen sector down. That is because we're listening to the screen sector and what they have to say. So we really do need to see some progress. Unfortunately, we haven't got a huge amount of time uh, today uh, to go through some of the recommendations, but I would like to recap uh, in a minute uh, the main ones that I think we need to be looking at. The new, the new, the new agency really must have true autonomy. It really must be able to deliver uh, on its budget effectively and not be held back by uh, some of the complicated processes and agencies that it works with. It really must be able to deliver to productions, not just the big ticket items, but to small scale productions as well. Individual producers, people with ideas and concepts need to be able to come to this agency and get genuine help and assistance where it's needed. The executive director must focus on screen and not be distracted by other forms of the creative arts. Uh, and we really need to see this as a journey towards a standalone agency. The committee was really clear on this. The industry itself was really clear on this. I, for one, cannot understand why the cabinet secretary uh, does not agree. And I, I, if she can explain otherwise, I'd be happy to hear. Uh, we really do need to get on with this. Uh, the Scottish screen sector is exciting and it is important. But my goodness, I don't want to have this conversation in another couple of years as to why we've let the Scottish screen sector down. It's not good enough and we must do better. Thank you very much. I call the Cabinet Secretary to wind up for the Government. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I began my uh, contribution to this debate setting out the successes of our screen sector and reporting on the dem demonstrable progress that we've made to provide effective public sector support. Uh, the points raised in my opening remarks, the MOUs have been agreed amongst partners. They've got a new approach to general business development, two programmes of specialist business support, Screen Scotland partners have got the in-depth skills review called upon, and work on increasing studio facilities are well underway. That is demonstrable progress, and indeed, I think we should reflect on the progress that we have made. The debate has underlined just how great the opportunity is. It's shown enthusiasm, but of course it's shown uh, frustration as well. The effect which funding for screen can have on economic spend, but also on our confidence, our reputation as a creative country and our international reach in attracting tourism cannot be underestimated. But we are achieving and our sector is achieving and we must um, uh, underline that. Gillian Martin uh, made an important point about uh, traineeships. Can I say to her that the funding for Outlaw King included support for 30 trainees, um, and I met some of them on set, uh, Craig, uh, Craig Miller Castle. I think Jamie uh, Halker Johnson also mentioned issues around screen. So, yes, I, I share ambitions. I, I want us to move faster. I understand the frustrations around some of these issues, particularly uh, around the studio issue. It's still important uh, to recognise how, how far we have come. To give you some perspective, I would remind you that 10 years ago, the equivalent public spending for screen unit was just three million pounds for Scottish screen. And that's about a sixth of what we have committed this year. And our total investment is more than other nations, like Denmark, Ireland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's almost a comparator uh, with England. Uh, I'm also encouraged by the progress that have been made, uh, but has been made by Screen Scotland and how the pace is picking up under the new executive director with a clear commitment to strong working partnerships now in place and support on business development, skills and forging the strategic partnerships with broadcasters moving ahead at pace. Many of you, and I think this is core to the report itself, have called for the immediate establishment of a standalone agency. I'm not persuaded that that is the imperative action and priority at this time. Screen Scotland today has all the tools and resources it requires to lead, support and promote our film and television sector. 
no, I've already taken an intervention from you. I'm very limited in time. There's no doubt we can draw on the new expertise we've added to Creative Scotland with David Strachan, Elizabeth Pertica, and Ewan Angus as new board members, bringing their records and their strength in guiding the Screen Scotland, and also new arrangements for the Screen Sector Leadership Group to have a strong voice with the executive. So that collaboration of industry and agency will bring renewed vigour to public sector support. The new website, the portal, the visible focal point for seeking support uh, that was recommended in the report has already been delivered. A suite of funding opportunities are, are there to be accessed. It would be premature to derail the effort that have, has been established over recent months by focusing on um, a standalone agency at this time. E equally, the time and effort involved in creating a new agency would divert us from the most important task, which is nurturing and growing our screen sector. And the last Labour Lib Dem Scottish Executive based, bear significant responsibility for the original merger of the Scottish Arts Council and Scottish Screen. Now, a lot of the debate, quite understandably, has focused on representations for a new, a new purpose-built studio in Scotland. And we support the wish for more infrastructure, and work is clearly underway to provide this. Creative Scotland have developed a business case for additional studio facilities and plan to launch a tender shortly for a studio operator with public sector backing. Um, there are success stories, undoubtedly, uh, with private sector-led consortium and initiatives in other countries and other parts of the United Kingdom, and also by city uh, organisations. But there are also instances where projects have gone less well, including where they have received public sector backing, and there can be the potential for legal challenge on state aid if the government itself leads this. Northern Ireland and Wales have used available vacant publicly owned property for some of their studio space, not least, of course, the shipyards and the Titanic. And other public sector investors have brought together a consortium to enable a purchase of private property for development. And we mustn't forget that in Ward Park, we have a permanent, successful working studio. The highly popular Outlander uh, has obviously filmed four series. In addition, Screen Scotland currently markets 136,000 square feet of stage space and 335,000 square feet of built space. I visited uh, Pathgate Pyramids, where Trainspotting 2 was filmed, and the Livingston Studio, where Churchill was based. We continue to welcome private sector initiatives for studios. I can't say much about the Pelton's case, a potential legal, act of a legal appeal. Um, and obviously, we also understand that the guard house interest uh, remains live. This has been a fantastic year for screen. Uh, we've started to see in our screens and our homes just what our industry can produce when the right support and right circumstances come together. And with that dedicated expertise of the recently and newly established Screen Scotland now in place with generous funding, planning for increased skills and business development support. I am excited, I am optimistic about the future of our film and television industry. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And I call on Claire Baker to close for the committee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This has been an interesting, if brief, debate with many insightful contributions. Our committee's report is the second major report from the Parliament. It is frustrating that MSPs who worked on the 2015 report find themselves commenting on the same issues that the sector say is holding them back. The sector has grown in recent years and Scotland is increasingly chosen as a fantastic location and members have highlighted our successes, but we are in danger of missing a huge opportunity. It is clear that if the sector is to meet its full potential and bring Scotland the cultural, the economic and social benefits that will come with that, the Government, Creative Scotland and the new Screen Unit and all its partners need to provide greater focus and ambition. We welcome the establishment of Screen Scotland and wish it every success. But in our report, we have made clear that we believe it needs to be empowered to do so. Our witnesses expressed a degree of frustration around engagement with public agencies, with too much bureaucracy and too slow decision making being a feature. As other members have highlighted, we continue to have concerns over a fragmented approach and overly bureaucratic governance arrangements. Having seen the success of the model in Northern Ireland and recognising the increasing global demand for content, the landscape has changed since the establishment of Creative Scotland. And we believe that Scotland should have an agency independent of any master. 
It is concerning that there's no commitment the Executive Director for Screen Scotland will continue to have a sole focus on screen, the business plan is still not finalised and we continue to have concerns that partner agencies do not fully understand the needs and diversity of the sector, principally Scottish enterprise. We do not wish to hamper the work of the screen sector, but we will closely monitor their progress and expect to see a strong, empowered, ambitious agency but we remain to be convinced that the current arrangements will facilitate that to the extent it needs to be. Members have emphasised the importance of a purpose-built film and TV studio. Notwithstanding the development at Ward Park, which is exclusive to Outlander, Scotland needs a flexible, fully equipped space able to attract international business as well as offer facilities for Indigenous productions and support the sector to grow. The importance of a fully equipped studio facilities cannot be emphasised enough by witnesses. There was frustration at the lack of progress in Scotland. This is not a new issue, but the Scottish Government in May 2013 said active discussions were underway, with an announcement expected soon. In 2015, statements were made about further discussions, and in 2016, an announcement was imminent. But so far, nothing has come to fruition. Then, at the weekend, there was an exclusive news story that an announcement was any day now. It is perhaps a surprise this has been greeted with a degree of scepticism. The committee supports the efforts of Screen Scotland and the Scottish Government in reaching a positive decision. We did, however, find it frustrating that the barriers identified by the Scottish Government in evidence, uh, state aid rules, the lack of suitable and available buildings, the lack of private sector investment, do not seem to have hampered Manchester, Belfast, Cardiff and the recently announced Birmingham complex in making studios a reality. MSPs have also made good points around public sector broadcasting and the need for robust Ofcom guidance. So the, there is much expectations for the new screen unit. For Scotland to have a vibrant, growing, ambitious sector, the screen unit has an important role in supporting the, uh, providing the building blocks, supporting the development of new ideas and intellectual property, supporting clear pathways and skills and training into the industry, maximising the wider benefits for the sector that international investment can bring through fair criteria in return for public sector investment. We all want to see the sector doing well. This is a tall order for any organisation, but we need to get serious about delivery. Part of Screen Scotland's remit is overseeing skills development. In closing, I want to highlight recent figures from BAFTA. As the nominations were announced for the Scottish BAFTAs a couple of weeks ago, Jude McClafferty, Director of BAFTA, drew attention to the lack of women shortlisted in major categories, including directing and writing. This is not uncommon at award ceremonies. Who's Calling the Shots, a report on gender inequality from Directors UK, focuses on women directors in UK television and shows that the gender gap is widening. Gillian Martin made good points on opportunity and exploitation in the sector. During the summer, I visited Screen Education Edinburgh after being impressed by their evidence to the inquiry. Working with disadvantaged communities, they work to nurture talent and creativity and raise attainment and aspirations among young people, as well as adult learners. They provide a pathway into the sector for people who might otherwise be excluded. So Screen Scotland has a role to play here, along with Skills Development Scotland. The new Screen Sector Skills Strategy for Scotland needs to have increasing diversity in the workforce as part of its outcomes. And to achieve that, we need targeted, proactive provision, which opens up opportunities in this sector and employees so that all of Scotland's talent can grow and contribute to the huge benefits an active screen sector can build to Scotland's economy and its creative and social cultural life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on behalf of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14421 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme. Could I, uh, any member wish to speak against the motion? No one does. I could I ask Graham Day to move the motion? Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. The question is that motion 14421 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn to decision time and there's only one question today. The question is that motion 14400 in the name of Joan McAlpine on making Scotland a screen leader, a report examining the Scottish screen sector be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed and that concludes decision time. We'll move on to members' business in the name of Jenny Gilruth. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats. <laughs>